We're going to be studying out of Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4.22. We're studying actually verse 23 and 24 also all kind of together now. We have advanced far enough to start incorporating the next two verses, even though we haven't handled the exegesis of them yet, we will eventually. So we're really studying Ephesians 4.22 to the rest of end of the chapter is where this extends to, but it's called changing clothes in the Christian way of life or breaking the dominance of the sin nature. Before we begin our Bible study this morning, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. Time to use the rebound technique if needed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We're praying for the men and women of our military who are fighting for that freedom around the world. Pray you build them up, protect them, encourage them, enable them to neutralize our enemies wherever they exist. Father, we pray for our policemen and women here inside America that you would protect them, encourage them. Enable them to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. Father, we pray for our leadership in America that you would continue to raise up men who could guide our country by its constitution and thereby protect our freedom. We pray for our friends around the world, Israel and Korea, our friends in the Philippines who are in ministry. Father, we pray that you would protect them. Enable them to carry your truth wherever it may be wanted. For our friends on the prayer list who are sick, Father, we pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are suffering, Father, we pray that you would re relieve them of their pain, remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who have lost loved ones, Father, we pray that you be with them in their grief, remind them of your precious promises, which brings a peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to review our verse here in Ephesians 4.22. My new King James, it says, That you put off, that means to change a piece of clothing, concerning your former conduct, that means your former way of life as either an unbeliever or a reversionist. The old man. The old man is the sin nature personified. It is you under the influence of the flesh, which grows corrupt. That word grows, it means to expand or put pressure outward. And that is what the lust pattern does. It spurs the old sin nature into action, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. We studied the 12 lust patterns of the old sin nature. I want to show you how far we've made it. We've been looking at Breaking the dominance of the old sin nature in the life. We have tackled quite a few subjects. First of all, we've seen that you have to understand how to operate clean from the priesthood. And if you can't, you see, that's the only way to unleash the power of the Spirit in the life. If, if you have unconfessed sin in life, the, the spirit is, he's quenched. He cannot function. He cannot fulfill his sevenfold ministry to the life of the believer in the church age. And so the issue is, is that you have to learn how to use the rebound technique. It's post-salvation confession of sins. And that's how you regain Cleanliness of the priesthood it is the bronze labor of the church age. It unleashes the power of the Spirit in your life. So first of all, you've got to know how to use the rebound technique and keep a short account with God 
in relation to personal sin. Secondly, you've got to gap it to the top. The, the link between you and super grace is a stack of Bible lessons. And you cannot do what you do not know. Our biggest problem in the Christian way of life is lack of knowledge. So you've got to learn the Bible. And Gap will get it in your soul. That's how we learn. It's the, it unleashes the power of the Word of God in your life. Thirdly, you need to know who you are in Christ. And through the identification and reckoning truths, we understand Christian psychology. We understand that we're, we're, modern psychology says you have to learn how to love all of you. That's incorrect. God the Father disliked your old man so much, he drove nails through him 2,000 years ago and buried him in a grave. And uh, so what part of it is that we are supposed to view uh, positively, and that is your life in Christ. That is that you share in the victory of Christ's resurrection. In other words, he walked out of the grave victorious over all fallen angels, and we share in that victory. He ascended through the heavenlies. He led captivity captive. In other words, the first segment of three Ambrose has been fulfilled, and that we share in the victory of his ascension, and that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the place of power, authority, and majesty, and our true life is hidden there with him. In other words, we are going to take, we're on the winning team. And the first part of the victory has already been held. We're going to get to take part in the second part of three Ambrose, and that is his triumphal return. We'll be there with him. And so our real life is hidden in Christ with God. That is the part of us that we're supposed to view positively. You are royalty. You're a child of God. You're on the winning team. And that is the part of you you have to learn about and cultivate and think about and concentrate upon. You see, there is true Christian psychology. It comes from the Word of God. So point three is knowing who you really are in Christ Jesus then you'll, you'll know who you are in this life. Fourthly, we, you need to know the lust patterns of the old sin nature and understand the motivation of mankind in doing so. We learned the 12 lust patterns. Now, we're going to move on to point number five. We're going to develop a, conscience, a conscious effort to identify temptations and areas of failure. In other words, we're going to develop discipline of thought and action. And your verse for this is 2 Corinthians 10.5. I want you to thumb over in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Talking about being on the winning team. I'm going to start in verse 4. Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, he's talking about the spiritual battle in which we find ourselves. We can't pick up a battle axe and slay the enemy. We can't take a club, and we can't pulverize the enemy. We can't use a slingshot and hit Goliath between the eyes. Our, the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're not instruments of war. We don't use an AR-15 to shoot our enemy. What is he saying then? He says, the battlefield is the mind. And the problem-solving devices and divine viewpoint thinking are our weapons. So the weapons of our warfare are not weapons of man. They're not a rifle. They're not a pistol. They're not a hand grenade. They're not a nuclear bomb. They're much more powerful than that. What did Jesus Christ use to defeat 
the temptation of Satan, the Word of God, the most powerful weapon that has ever been devised, and God gave it to us. So he's saying the weapons of our warfare are not puny like man's weapon of war. If you think about uh, a rifle, it's very limited in scope because how many rounds of ammunition can you carry? A typical Marine carries 300 rounds and he has a 70-pound pack. He has to train intensely to be able to carry that much. 300 enemy is all he could account for. And there's millions and millions and millions of enemies. And he can only take care of three of them. Well, guess what? The Word of God is so powerful that it can take out the entire enemy force. And God has given it to you. And you can carry it around, and it's not heavy. You can carry it in your soul. And therefore, you have the capacity as a one-man army to go to war and win in the angelic conflict by what's between your ears. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not, uh, they don't take uh, up space and time. They are spiritual. But mighty, he says. And the word for mighty is dunamis. I like that word because it's the word we get dynamite from. It means explosive power. And a lot of you don't get to deal with dynamite, but I do. We run it in different percentages through race car engines. And uh, nitromethane is how it, we use it. And it's the most powerful fuel that you can run through a race car engine. In other words, it is so powerful that you can't really run it straight. You have to ease into it. And uh, they have fuel where you might run 2% nitromethane or 5%. And 5% is so strong that most tuners can't get past that point without ruining several engines trying to find a tune-up for just a 5% nitromethane and when you get into some of the pro tuner classes they can get all the way up to 80 percent nitromethane but it's so destructive that they have to change the components of the engine with only five seconds running time at wide open throttle and so it call it's a stack of hundred dollar bills just to crank the thing up you got to have a corporate sponsor to field a nitro car and so when I see this word dunamis, it means something to me. Mean. It means the most powerful thing that you can ever come in contact with. It's explosive power, and God has given it to you. And the difference is, in the Christian way of life, he has given us the perfect tune-up. We've got the leadership of the Spirit and the power of the Word of God in the life coming together in the church age. To form a dynamic way of life. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not measly. They're not weak. But mighty. Explosive power. In God. For pulling down strongholds. Now these strongholds are wrong thinking. They're human viewpoint thinking. And so what God has done is given us his word. And we're going to. Reform the life, the Bible says, to metamorphe, to change. Now, we're going to come back to verse 5. At this point, I need to come over. and We're going to start taking a look at some new concepts in relation to bringing down strongholds. You have that PowerPoint, old man thought system. So we're going to have six different categories here to look at.
the one thing I want to do is take you through a series of a chain of events as, as we say it that, uh, that happened to every one of us and some people start, stop mid-course but here's what I want you to do is I want you to think about how life happened to you and that's from the point of your physical birth all the way up into the grave how life happened to you and you should know that life impressed upon you even from your earliest days uh, you heard your mother's voice you knew her warmth you knew her comfort and uh, didn't know how to speak so you cried when you needed attention and whether it was hunger or a belly ache or a need a new diaper that's how you communicated well eventually you found English and you learned maybe not how to use it first but went uh uh and your mother said no you're going to ask what do you want so you had to use the discipline of of thought and speech I would like a cookie and then you heard not until after your dinner and uh Maybe you said, well, I'll find a way around this authority. And you waited for mother to disappear and you got into the cookie jar. And then uh, mother comes back in and she says, now, did you eat a cookie when I told you not to? And you've got chocolate chip all the way around your mouth and you got it on your hands and your shirt and everything. So, uh-uh. And then mama says, okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson about life. Do not lie, and she gets a switch out and tans your hide. And now you've learned uh, discipline and authority, and you learned a lesson. You say, okay, I'm not going to lie. This is why it tells us in the Bible, parents discipline your children. Otherwise, they are prison fodder. See, if you don't teach them right then and there, what are they going to do when they find they come into contact with their police officer, uh, the judge on a bench. Uh, and so the idea is that we train a child up in the way they should go. They will not depart from it, whether that is immorality or in the Christian way of life, it happens the same way. And so life impresses upon us, whether uh, there is a lot of negative or a lot of positive uh, you may go to kindergarten and you may get bullied. You may get ostracized and you may not be part of the in click. And that's what happens. And there's uh, a lot of psychological events that happen to young people and that some of them are not prone or susceptible to uh, these kinds of problems and some are highly susceptible or sensitive to these kinds of problems and they're impressed upon because of it. So uh, they move on and they may uh, want to be in a, a social group and they may be ostracized from it or try to try out for a cheerleader or a football team or uh, whatever it is. And uh, it happens to all of us. I, was, I wanted to be in athletics in junior high and I tried out for the football team, but I was too scrawny. And then I tried out for the basketball team, but I couldn't bounce the ball because I was raised in the country, and you can't dribble a basketball out in the country because every time it hits the ground, you hits a pothole or a crawdad mound, and it shoots out across the yard, so you just got to carry the ball and shoot. That's illegal, I didn't know. And then uh, I tried out for the track team, but I was too slow. And so... They let me stay in athletics, but I was in off-season all year round. So what did I do? Just drills and running all the time, mindless running. They'd put us out on the track, and we would just jog in circles while the rest of the team practiced together. It didn't affect me. Being part of an athletic organization in high school that I wasn't accepted, it didn't bother me at all. I said, fine. I'll jog around the track, and me and my buddies who didn't make the team, we all jogged together, and we had a great time out there in the mornings. And But there were some who were just des devastated because they didn't get on the football team. They didn't get a jersey. They didn't get a set of pads. And uh, 
Maybe they became angry about it. Maybe they dealt with it in another way. And so what we're looking at here is that life affects us all different ways, different levels. Life impresses upon us. The idea is, is that we grow up hauling all of this baggage with us. We develop human viewpoint and old man solutions. And so uh, you're not accepting me into my group, into your group. I'm just going to gossip and malign you and criticize you to everyone else. And I'm going to, I'm going to practice character assassination. See, that's what happens when some people are ostracized socially. They attack the group that they weren't accepted into. Or they spread lies and slander, so on and so forth. Well, it's a terrible sin. It's old man. Maybe they attack with physical violence. I'll punch you in the nose. That's an old man solution. Maybe they just get anger, wrath, vengeance, malice. See, all of these are old man solutions. And so we develop these problem old man uh, solutions through life. And it's human viewpoint. It's not God's way. Eventually, all of these systems are developed into a subconscious old man reaction. In other words, you don't even have to think about it. Someone comes to you and they're angry, your first reaction is to punch them square in the nose. And uh, it works a lot. It really shuts them up and it makes them grab their face and uh, walk away and you feel great about life. But it's an old man reaction. Solve the problem, but not God's way. You didn't even have to think about it. That's the idea. You did what came natural. Get a big problem, can't solve it, you sublimate. Whether you go out and drink, Get on drugs or just trying to do something that's different to get your mind off of it. All kinds of subconscious old man. Now remember, reaction, that's a negative word. I started to put it in all caps. Would uh, see that. Reaction. And it's subconscious. You don't have to think about it. And this is the way we sin most of the time. Now remember, we used our volition initially learning this old man reaction, but now it becomes a subconscious application. We don't even have to think about it. That's just what we do when this situation comes up. Whether it's anger, wrath, malice, rage, whether it's hypersensitivity and emotion, whether it's self-pity. See, we don't even have to think about it. It's just how we handle the problem. So here's what you need to recognize, that a lot of the sinning that we do, it just happens subconsciously and we just follow what's natural. Now, we learned it through our volition early on, but we habituated an old man reaction. Habituation is a good term. Now becomes a subconscious old man reaction. Then we, at some point, became saved. Born again, if you will. Came to the foot of the cross, and we saw where Jesus Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. In our place. We accepted him as our Savior. Well, from that point, God gives us some commands. In Romans 12, 2, it says, be metamorphe, be changed. Read it. My new King James, so I don't give you the Brad version. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, that's what happened to us early on. 
when we were impressed upon. But be transformed, that's metamorphe, by the renewing of your mind through gap. And so after salvation, we're supposed to learn doctrine and be changed by it. In our verse, Ephesians 4.23, it says, Be renewed through the breathing of your mind. Soul functioning gap. Where doctrine is, doctrine is circulated. And then in Colossians 3.10, over to that one, it says, and have put on the new man, that is like a piece of clothing, who is renewed in knowledge, epinosis, according to the image of him who created him. And so the challenge after salvation is to metamorphosize. It is to throw off the old man, his thinking, and his solutions to life, and to learn the new man thinking and his solutions to life. This is where our verse comes in. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, bringing every thought into captivity for Christ. That means that we have to slow down and we have to recognize whether we're being tempted, what kind of situation we're coming into. We have to have discipline of thought. We have to say, now, my normal old man reaction right here is to make a good fist and fake with the left and throw the right. That's how I handle this situation. But it's physical violence, and the Bible says, I am to love my enemies and pray for those who persecute me. And so, therefore, I've got to change, and it hurts. And I don't get to throw punches anymore where I want to. Now I'm going to practice love, which means I'm going to give them the freedom to be offensive to me, I'm going, to I'm going to remain in relaxed mental attitude, free from mental attitude sins. I'm going to smile. But see, you've got to stop and think. Wait, here comes a temptation. I'm tempted to get into physical violence here. What am I going to do? I'm going to rela remain relaxed. So this is where pain starts. See, this is where ha it's hard this is where discipline happens. Most Christians don't have the, what it takes to do this. And that is why it's part of the super grace life. It's not a baby believer issue. It's a maturity issue. The baby believer will fall into every trap there is. They don't have enough doctrine to be changed by the word of God. And therefore you can't expect them to act any differently than an unbeliever. They're simply good when they're in front of you and they fall into every old man trap there is when they're not. Don't expect a baby believer to have enough doctrine to be changed, see? It's the person who is breaking into maturity that has discipline of thought. Well, we fail. And that's the truth. We all fail. But since God didn't take us to heaven, you know what that means? Try and try again. And he leaves us here on earth. See, he let Israel march 40 years in the desert so they could continually try to get it right. He said, there's still hope for them. I'm giving them 40 years to get it right. So we try and we try again. Even though we may fail a hundred times, we may get it right on 101. You see, God left us here to get it right. And we can't give up, even though we may fail. We have to keep on learning doctrine, and we have to keep on trying to perfect that application. Try and try again. That's one of the things my father taught me that's helped me in my professional life 
is that don't give up. You may be on... You may be right on the verge of a breakthrough. Having, you know, you may give up at the, the time before you're just about to have it perfected. And so we have to try. We have to keep on trying. We don't give up. We may fail and we may be disappointed for a moment. God give us another opportunity to get it right, I guarantee you. Try and try again. This is, see, we're, we're, you're getting into the pain of the Christian way of life. And this is where Paul says, that which I want to do, I do not. In Romans chapter 7, he experienced the issue. The thing that he really wanted to do, he kept failing in. But what did he do? He kept on pressing on towards the goal, the upward call in Christ Jesus. And eventually he made it there. Finally, when we do it right, 20, well, not, let's see, here we try and we fail, and then we finally get to a conscious new man response. In other words, we developed an awareness about the situation, and we pulled up the proper problem-solving device, and we applied it in a timely manner. So, you may have been prone to fear before. But now, when the storm and the tornado pop up, you say, I'm trusting God and His plan totally. And my well-being and my safety is completely up to Him at this point. I'm powerless to do anything except trust Him. And here I am, trusting God. I'm not living in fear. See, that's the application of the faith rest drill. Trusting God. So you develop a conscience. That means an aware. New man response. You're not doing what comes natural. Once again, pain. Pain. See, there's pain in change. There's pain in application of doctrine. There's pain in discipline of thought. There's pain in all of these things. It's grinding it out. But what happens in the end? You cultivate the Christian way of life and super grace living. And when Caleb and Joshua were marching through the desert, it was painful. There's lots of sand and lots of hills and lots of heat, lots of exposure. Everyone's complaining except them. They were the only two, with a, besides Moses, with a positive mental attitude. It was seemingly an impossible situation, waiting for their generation to die before they could take the promised land. But guess what? They had discipline of thought. When they came and they took a tour of the promised land, they said, we can take it. God has said, we can take it. Joshua was their leader. First in thinking and then a military victory. And so that's the issue of no man's land. We call it gate seven in the divine dinosphere. It's momentum's testing. It's the desert where we march and we I'm going to take the momentum test in eight different categories, whether it's the people test, prosperity test, disaster test, system test, the old sin nature test, so on and so forth. We're going to get it right, and God's going to require that we get it right, and we make the application time and time again. Before we advance. And that is where we have made it. We cross the river Jordan in this lifetime. Into ultra super grace. Gate 8. And we now have done it correctly so many times. That we have a subconscious new man response. Someone comes to you and they're aggravated and they're angry and they're mad. 
you're, you automatically put a smile on your face. You're the Clint Eastwood of agape love. Another opportunity to flex my spiritual muscle. What can I do for you today? I'm sorry you're so offended. I think I can help. You don't even have to think about it. You just go totally into relaxed mental attitude. When before, you just matched their aggression. You see down here, human viewpoint, old man solutions, and a subconscious old man reaction. That was the way you handled it back then. But now in ultra super grace, you don't even have to think about it. Problem solving device, agape love, is at the forefront of the mentality. And you're calm and cool as a cucumber in every situation when it comes to mankind. So what you're seeing here is in fact why God left you on earth. He wants to cultivate the Christ life in you. And we can cross the Jordan in this lifetime. That's what gate 8 is, the winner's gate. And so let's take a look at our other PowerPoint here. Old man thought systems. This is how life impressed upon you and you learned how to deal with it. We're going to have six different categories of old man thought systems. First is rationalization. One of the most common systems of thought. When you used, when you rationalize the situation, you form a self-justification within the mentality of the soul. What I'm doing is legitimate. In other words, the mentality of the soul justifies wrong action. And I have pastor friends who go through and they know it's wrong. They know it's wrong and they do it anyway. They do baby dedications. And I've got pastor friends who have enough doctrine to know better. And this, see, this branched right out of the Catholicism, which was, you know, they're going to christen the baby. And somehow it's going to get sprinkled and it's a, a Christian. And it's not even old enough to speak yet. And... Uh, so these people filtered over into the Methodist and Baptist organizations and they say somehow we need to recognize these children. We need to welcome them into the church and we want a ritual that kind of uh, resembles that which we came from in Catholicism. And so once a year, they get all the families up with their babies they pin the tail on the donkey and they say, look, we're going to dedicate this baby to Christ, not knowing what's going to happen to that child. And the truth is they've got their own volition and they have to grow up and decide for or against Christ themselves. We're in an angelic conflict. And the first question on the test of the angelic conflict is what do you think of Christ? Not whether you've been christened as a baby or not. And then half the time the kid is born out of wedlock or the grandparents are raising it or there's some kind of terrible condition back behind the situation and the whole congregation sitting there looking at this baby saying, how did that baby get here? 
Now you led the whole congregation into mental attitude sins just by putting this baby up in front. And the same thing happens at Mother's Day when they pin the tail on the donkey. They say, oldest mother, mother of most children, and then youngest mother. And it's always some girl who, who's had a baby and they're not married. Now the whole congregation sinning because you had some religious ritual. See, these pastors are justifying the situation because everybody else is doing it, and it's great to satiate approbation lust. Approbation lust. And so, big problem in local churches, and if any of these pastors were worth their salt, they would chop that thing right off immediately and say, and we're not pinning the tail on the donkey around here and uh, we have cut baby dedications and we have cut the Mother's Day biblical of pinning the tail on the donkey. And uh, justification is, uh, it happens a lot in our lives. We feel like we're justified in doing many things and I, I retreat because I won't hit yours. Bible says don't do it, don't do it. We can try to make our way around it and it's rationalization and self-justification. Point number two, old man thought systems, emotional adjustment to the problems and frustration of life. I love the phrase from the colonel. If you solve your problems by emotion, you are insane at the time you are doing it. That means get a straight jacket for you. I would love to put that up on the chalkboard at work, but it would be offensive to so many. And so therefore, I just keep that little gem between you and I. You solve your problems by emotion, you're insane at the time you are doing it. And the perfect example is, is Jesus pre-crucifixion. You think about all of the situations he went through in his six different trials where the only innocent man to ever live was condemned. And he, he did not try to uh, vindicate himself at all. The extreme touting he received as the king of the Jews. In other words, they pressed a thorn of a crown of thorns into his head and beat him with a staff and mocked him. That was that was an extreme form of torture and mocking and you think he could have blistered the earth with what happened there and he did not vindicate himself one bit. He only answered Pilate and he says, it is as you say, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, legions of angels would come. They would, they would blister you. You'd be a pile of ash, sir. Did not handle it by emotion. And when the <clears throat> Romans drove nails through his hand, could have been anger, rage. Many things, and what did he do? He, he did not handle it by emotion. Went to God in prayer. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the hours pre-crucifixion for Christ were perfect examples of how you handle intense situations, non-emotionally, but with doctrine. <clears throat> To 
to be able to pull off that kind of application is only the ground of the ultra super grace belief. Anyone else will fall off the cliff of emotion, feel sorry for self, they will feel anger, rage, and even when his friends, he was there on the cross pre-crucifixion, you know, they crucified him at nine in, in nine in the morning, and he hung there for three hours before the judgment started. What happened? All the disciples left except a couple, I think maybe one. He was abandoned by his friends, so-called friends. And then he was mocked as the Messiah. If you're, if you're truly the Messiah, come down from there. So many mental attitude tests that he went through, and he passed with flying colors. So emotion is the opposite of application of Bible doctrine to life experience, wisdom. Motion is the appreciator of the soul, and it's good. It's excellent when you use it in its own right environment. But it is terrible. We contort it. So some people try to solve every problem in life by emotion, whether it's a fit of self-pity, oh, poor me, rage, tantrum, or so on. It's funny because you can train a child out of this. A kid will throw themselves on the floor and throw an absolute fit when you tell them you can't have a piece of candy. It's too close to dinner time. And they throw a wall-eyed fit. And you know what the parent says that solves all the psychological problems that go with this? And people grow up doing this still. When they don't get their way, they throw a fit. You know what the phrase that I learned at an early age is? Let me give you something to cry about. And if you never heard that phrase, you were abused. And you grew up throwing wall-eyed fits as an adult because you would never heard the phrase, let me give you something to cry about. Oh, you want to throw a fit and cry? Let me give you a good reason for that. Oh, yeah. Got a lot of them running around on the street right now. They're called leftists. They're offended by every opportunity. They're going to take it to the maximum. So the direct attack has three concepts. First of all, to get attention. It attempts to sap satisfy the approbation lust of the individual. To control people. Oh, you're not going to do what I want you to do? Let me throw a tantrum. Let me throw a fit. Let me get angry. Let me get into self-pity. Let, uh, let me have a little cry here right in front of you. Make you feel guilty. To control people and the environment around them stems from power lust. Or to be spiteful and so strong in revenge that people simply stop in their tracks. They're afraid to go on in any way because of revenge or spite tactics that are used. In other words, you're nearly a criminal when it comes to getting someone back. Well, that's the second old man thought pattern. Under of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for rebuke, Rebuke for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're studying in the word of truth and we're looking at how to take, uh, how to break the dominance of the sin nature in the life. And right here we've got six examples of old man thinking 
we've just looked at back rationalization. Now we've looked at emotional adjustment. Let's move on. Thirdly, defense mechanism. A defense mechanism is a human viewpoint designed to protect the soul against the pressures it is too weak to bear. In other words, you may be a born-again Christian, but you may not have any tools to handle anything. Therefore, you get into defense mechanisms. There it is, uh, two contrasting uh, stories. You heard about the couple who were studying the life of Abraham and the husband had a medical emergency and they had to rush to the ER and the ER doctor came out and was talking to the wife and told the wife, said, I'm afraid it's a hopeless situation. And if you studied the Abraham series, you know there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. That was her first Reaction to the doctor's message. There's no such thing as a hopeless situation. I'm afraid you don't understand, ma'am. Your husband may die. She said, He who believes in me shall never die. Ma'am, I thought you would be distraught. And the woman issued the personal sense of destiny, we are all going to die someday. While we are here, we're going to apply doctrine for me to live as Christ and to die as God. And the doctor was dumbfounded. Because every other person he had ever told that to fell apart on the spot. And this woman had doctrine in her soul, and therefore she was wise. And then the uh, opposite end of the spectrum is where you get fall apart itis at every bad news you fall apart and you form a new defense mechanism. A change of thought pattern leads to a change of behavior. A person who has no tools, for example, becomes disillusioned with boring Bible classes. In other words, they, during life, they derive their happiness through their loved one, their husband or their wife. And they never developed a relationship with Christ to the point to where they had the happiness of God. They shared the joy of God, plus H. And they never rounded the curve in their spiritual life to ever even think about the fact that they could be living alone and that their relationship with Jesus Christ was more important than the relationship to their spouse. What you find out is that when your relationship with Christ is cultivated and is magnified, the relationship with the spouse gets better. It's not that you leave it behind. It actually gets better. Because you're seeing life in the right light. My, my mother used to sing a song. She's in a, it went like this. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Uh, anyway, it says, please, you make me happy so. Please don't take my sunshine away. But really what that was was a human viewpoint song. Because you can't get happiness from people. You have to cultivate your happiness and share the happiness of God. 
And if you have a great relationship with a person, that's wonderful. But you have to realize it's for time. In eternity, we'll be brothers and sisters, and it'll be a different situation. And so, people become disillusioned with whatever traumatic event they've gone through. They develop a defense, defense mechanism. They may jump from Bible class into a social life or even emotional religion as an excuse. Fourth is denial. We're looking at human viewpoint thinking, human viewpoint thought pattern, old man thought patterns. Denial. It's human viewpoint adjustment which ignores or attempts to ignore some difficulty or danger. What's amazing about this is that the human soul, in order to protect itself, sometimes goes into denial. And you may even totally forget about any traumatic event because you have no tools to handle the situation whatsoever and therefore, it is buried deep in the subconscious part of the soul. The problem is, is that it will resurface. And then when it does, you should have the proper tools to deal with it. And many times in children, especially abused children, this denial, which is formed into a burial, really, of a traumatic event deep in the subconscious may resurface later. And it can come forth as some, some deep trauma. The issue is if you're getting Bible classes in random, in, in rapid uh, session, you'll have the truth you need to deal with it. But if you're not, hold on. You may be married to someone who has this, has something buried like this, and they don't even know it's there. When this thing comes frothing up, you're in for it, buddy. You're in for a ride. So what's the issue? It was the same issue as Adam and Eve. Adam should have made sure Eve was paying attention in Bible class. And because he neglected his own authority, guess what? He was seduced. And so denial is a problem-solving device. It is a human viewpoint solution. And uh, you can be in denial about all kinds of situations and problems in life. And uh, it's, it, uh, it's, it's only going to compound them one of these days you're going to have to stand up and you're going to have to meet the problems of life instead of burying them. That's what being an adult is about. So it is a human viewpoint solution and it is even a uh, part of the soul that God designed for childhood trauma until you could get to a place where you can handle it. Very sensitive area for some because they've experienced some trauma of some sort in their childhood. But let me tell you something. God has supplied the answers for every problem you would face in life in eternity past. There is no situation that he hasn't thought about and provided a solution for you. You may think you're special, but you're not. God has provided a solution. And as long as you're rejecting the solution, you're going to suffer. It's up to you to dig in. Find what you need in the warehouses of Bible doctrine. Hear your soul. The fifth old man thinking, old man viewpoint, Old man problem solving device is sublimation. Sublimation has two sides psychologically. 
there is good sublimation example to pull a baby's hand out of its mouth and substitute the hand with a rattle or something it can chew on so now they've got a chew toy or whatever it is a pacifier or something instead of chewing on their hand which is better for an adult you take someone who has you take an adult male who has nothing to do he's going to get into trouble you put a steel fence post driver in his hands for eight hours a day he will not be in trouble he will go home and eat dinner and he's going to sit in the lazy boy and go to bed he is going to sleep hard you see it was it was you figured out the human soul that's the way god designed a man in his working age he's supposed to get out and do his duty as a adult human and work and he sleeps good and he eats good and uh, he doesn't get into trouble that's good sublimation there is a negative aspect sublimation is a human viewpoint adjustment through finding a new outlet for a drive or frustration you're frustrated in some way so you go out and play golf People who seek happiness through drinking or drugs. There's some kind of new project or adventure. In other words, trying to solve the problem of frustrations with some form of entertainment or something which really does not meet the problem. sublimation can really cultivate a lot more problems when you start using that as an old man problem solving device and uh, really a downward spiral So we get a lot of people functioning in sublimation and I would suspect a lot of them that are going through the drive through over here to get some kind of CBD oil or whatever it is they sell over there is a big part of that. The sixth human viewpoint solution or problem solving device or old man thinking, subjectivity. It's the self life versus the Christ life. Me, myself, and I versus God and others. It's amazing uh, because Lucifer himself is the perfect example of the self-life. He became so impressed with his self and his beauty and his uh, personality and uh, how many compliments he was receiving and uh, the fact that he was uh, top tier as an angelic being. and He was so, uh, he had eyes on self so much that he developed a vision of grandeur and that he said I am uh, I am too good for what uh, this job that God has given me and that uh, I, I believe I should be elevated and I should be at a higher stature than where I'm at and I'm going to uh, become a leader of angels and number one if you will and so uh, Lucifer was the original intense self-concentrator. 
self-life. Uh, developed a vision of grandeur in relation to self. Just about every rap song there is is a vision of grandeur about being the perfect criminal uh, in the perfect situation with the perfect amount of money and violence and women and drugs and all of these things. It's a vision of grandeur. It, it, uh, this extends into almost every avenue of life, whether what is your vision of yourself. And uh, amazing that it, uh, it gets so bad that uh, you need to remember what Jesus says. To be first is to be last in this life. And those who make themselves a slave of all will be the leaders of the next. Quite the opposite of me, myself, and I. People get so concentrated on self that they can't think about others and to be the, the, one of the fruit of the Spirit is thoughtfulness for others. A true thoughtfulness for others is completely blanked out by subjectivity. You cannot think of others because you're constantly thinking of yourself and how you're being affected and how all the uh, things are going to work in your favor or not. So subjectivity is a big problem and even with the internet it makes it worse and you're not really who you are on the internet you're who are who you are hidden in in, in Christ is who you really are and uh, the Bible says your real life is hidden there it's not it's not what's on uh, Instagram or Facebook what is your real life and it that may be empty. Might not have invested anything into that life of Christ, but you're still alive. There's still hope for you. So subjectivity is a uh, old man way of thinking. Uh, I think that uh, many times it really gets cultivated into a satanic attitude on life. Lucifer himself was, he was exalted in his own thinking because of the compliments he was receiving from fellow angels. He got complimented one too many times beyond his own integrity Flipped his hair one too many times. I don't, I don't know that angels had long flowing hair, but I can imagine Lucifer flipped his when he received a compliment. I know. You're so beautiful, Lucifer. I know. Subjectivity. Well, there were six different realms of human viewpoint thinking. And... We're going to continue to study our breaking the dominance of the sin nature in the life. And next week, we're going to take a look at discipline of thought. Discipline of thought. And how we have to control what is going through our minds. And we have to say, we have to be able to hit the brakes ourselves and say, hold up, I'm not going to go down that path. That's where I always get into trouble. I always go out here. And then when I start thinking about it, I get angry. I want to tell you, 
You watch what's happening to the United States right now and all of the different scenarios of how we're going down. You can get really angry and depressed. But you've got to remember, friend, we've got to get into the tribulation somehow and the United States is not mentioned there. And so it's your uh, opportunity when you see bad news on the news to hit click and go off. Say, you know what? I'm not going down that road. I am going to concentrate on Jesus Christ as he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in a place of power and authority. See, I'm going to concentrate on the above things. There was the bad road I could have went down. I could have been disappointed. I could have been depressed. I could have been angry over here. But I know for some reason we've got to go down this road. And therefore, I am going to not base my happiness on what the newsman says. But my position in Christ and my future with him. See, that's discipline of thought. And we're going to begin to cultivate that next Sunday morning. Okay, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning. Studying our way through changing clothes in the Christian way of life, Ephesians 4.22. I want to pray with you and then I want to do a roll call. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the fact that you have delivered us from every problem that we'll ever run into in this lifetime. It's very relieving. To know that you have it all handled. The fact that all we have to do is just dig in and find the answer in your word. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.